Taste is a concept that can be very limiting. Is this taste good taste, bad taste? Whose taste? Whose taste is it, you know? I think that the very notion of taste is something to kind of push through. The AD100 is an annual list of talents in architecture, interior design, and landscape design who we, the editors at AD, feel were important and influential in that year. It's really hard because it's a hundred names and there are clearly more than 100 notable talents in the world. We have multiple meetings. They can get heated. People can make a case for someone. I would compare it to a red carpet. When you look at a major red carpet, you want to feel that you're seeing the stars of today and the rising stars of tomorrow. I really look at the AD100 as a, a group of super talented, influential individuals who can really help us to explore the idea of taste in a richer way. When you first use the word taste, I think of food, right? When you're eating something and, and whether you like it or not, there's no right or wrong to that. There's the things that you like and the things that you're like, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> and, and, and for me, it's, it's the same with, with taste and design. This whole culture of the L-shaped sofa and beige, sort of minimal, safe, beige. I hate it beige, but I think hopefully that culture is changing a little bit rooms or interiors are becoming more uh, personal and um, and that's the key element. A lot of the way that we see the world, it's so conditioned in our thinking that it's hard to understand the ways in which it's restricting us. That's why I wanted to be a designer in the first place was the kind of unbridled sense of imagining what's possible. I think often in the early stages of a project, you, you sort of experiment with things that are somewhat jarring. A little sort of ugly. Something in it provokes you or attracts you or maybe even repulses you. But that's why you need to, to poke at it more. There's people who are very avant-garde, who are really out there pushing the boundaries of architecture. You're also getting a peek into the homes of people who we feel we might know or have an opinion about. How does Kylie Jenner live? How does Kendall Jenner live? A designer like Martin Lawrence Ballard, he is the celebrity whisperer. Nobody does celebrities like Martin and gives you that fantasy lifestyle and that sort of California dream. I think they feel they can explore all the fantasies around how they want to live with no judgment and the way that someone feels they're most comfortable and fulfilled and happy in their home is probably ultimately good taste. We are in my living room here in my house in LA. It's really Daisy's house. <laughs> We have this wonderful dome ceiling. It was sort of my own version of the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Designers' homes are our experiment pads. So you have to try things for yourself. These amazing palm trees came from the Yves Saint Laurent sale. It's my mad mix. It's things that make me happy. There's been a lot of wild requests over the years. A sex room is a big one these days. People love a sex room. We've had a room that had to be quilted in black patent leather to look like a Chanel handbag. Not quite sure what that fancy was, but I'm down for it. You know, at one point, somebody asked me to gold leaf a garage. We parted ways over that one. People say to me all the time, oh, what is it like decorating for celebrities? What's it like doing these houses? Everybody in the world is the same at the end of the day. But the difference with a celebrity is that they can't run down the road, you know, to get a pint of milk. So you have to create everything that they need. It's really about creating real, real personal space where they feel protected and where they feel joyous. Interiors have to be joyous. They have to be spaces that make us happy. 
from about the age of 10 or 11, I started collecting things. And on my way home from school every day, I would stop off at vintage junk shops and I'd go rummaging through to find out what they'd got in new that day. What I was doing was training myself to become a designer, but I wanted to be an actor. By the time I was 21, I thought, right, I'm going to Hollywood, I'm going to be discovered, and I'm going to be a movie star. I ended up getting cast in a movie. Basically, I was cut out of the whole thing in the end. But what happened from that is I met one of the producers, and he and his then-girlfriend came to this little house that I had. You know, everything in my house was from the flea markets. And they were like, oh my god, this is amazing. Will you come and decorate? I thought, maybe if I do it, they're going to put me in another movie. And they loved it and my career was born. Ellen Pompeo, who's a longtime client of mine, loves the whole idea of bardo slung on a chaise in the middle of a beach with a daiquiri. Quite like the sound of that myself. I'm a huge fan of the French Riviera and that whole vibe. South of France is definitely a huge inspiration. You know, the materials, the teak of the house, the sort of the concrete in the floors, it has so many elements of the French 60s. But the part of this house that I love the most is that it's got so much of you mixed up in it. It's got the sex appeal, it's got the family life, it's got the actress. It really does, because design aesthetic is one thing, but where is the character, where is the soul? I took inspiration from Gioponti for this marble wall in her bedroom. In her living room, you are engulfed in a glorious, glamorous Brazilian marble. All reminiscent of the waves. It's that subliminal connection that really makes design work. Design is to trigger us, not just to make beautiful wallpaper. And so my process to this day still is based on feeling. When I think about creating a room, I really start with the feeling approach. How is this room going to make you feel? How is it going to support your well-being? You're trying to, you know, evoke emotion and, and create a narrative through design. There are certain spaces that make you really static and calm, and there are spaces that cause motion and movement. I love playing with that, that tension. People like Pamela Shamshiri are really pushing to say, you could look at your visual world and your built world in a totally different way. She's not just decorating the room and like placing things in it. She is beloved by her clients. She is gonna live in that house with you and experience that house as you would experience it. This is my studio. We wanted it to feel like a home and a house and do for our team what we do for our clients. And so we have a big communal kitchen. There's a bar in like every room. <laughs> A big thing about our firm is that we don't really differentiate between architecture or interior design or graphics. Ideas are welcome from everyone. We're definitely thinking about the whole picture and, and it's really a holistic look because of it. There's prototypes and materials and pieces everywhere. I think my favorite object is a Frank Lloyd Wright textile block that we found on a project digging out the dirt. It's right there in the ground, like five feet under. You just don't know. You just have to be open and ready. I think I just love it because it's something we unearth on a job site and it's a link to the past. I'm always looking for those lessons like from the past to carry forward and, you know, making those connections. <laughs> and Adam, they had such a hand in coming up with their narrative. It was, what if Wes Anderson had bought a California Swiss chalet and Yves Saint Laurent was coming over? I think I'm a little obsessed with time travel. 
gonna sound like a crazy <laughs> but, um My dad is Iranian and my mom is Italian. We lived in a tower in Tehran. It was very Mesian. The old and the new are side by side and you really get a sense of layers of history there. I was really uh, studious in Turkey, but also very escapist. I was really into my books and a big dreamer and just lots of fantasy and play. 1979, Iran exploded in violence. My brother, my mom and I were here for Christmas and then the revolution happened and my dad got stuck and came out, I think three years later. We left our dog, we left our shoes, we, you know, we left everything and there's something really empowering when you have to like reset up your life so abruptly overnight. With all that loss, I dove into the fantasies of the home and life for other people. I feel really lucky that I get to carry that out and have a hand in setting up uh, new chapters in people's lives now. This project that we highlighted of, of Pam's is a historic house, and it's a real knockout, but a challenging house too to actually live a life in. felt the spirit of that house. The house was designed by A. Quincy Jones. It was his favorite house. It just took my breath away. My client's was statuesque. Persian woman, she's a student of architecture and she's a patron of the arts and starting a gallery. I feel like you're a long lost sister for me. We just have so much in common. We were at a place in both of our lives where we were in similar transitions. Moving out of um, like a marriage or a relationship that didn't work, mm -hmm. and then finding ways that we could reinvent ourselves. She's so invested in this house and wanting to bring it to its best place but also looking out for her own comfort and her new needs as her kids left the house. I mean, if I'm that in love with the building and the, and the person, then it's a, then I'm hooked. But what I was really freaked out about was I could tell that we really needed to make some big shifts. There's a lot of guessing and a lot of fantasizing about what the architect's intentions were. Like the kitchen, which is a circular kitchen, and probably something Quincy Jones would have maybe never done, but we had clues that it, he could have done it too. <laughs> so. I was standing above the great room and everyone was down below waiting for answers from me, which is like my life. And I looked at the stairs. I could see that each stair was a different length. And the floor pattern, there was also rhythm. I was like, a bit, I'm like, he, he was into jazz. He was into, you know, freeforming a bit. I realized even though his was very geometric and rectilinear, we could bring natural lines in. I think as long as we're honoring the intention, then we can take some liberties. And once we figure that out, it brings freedom. I just really believe in being like humble and open and looking for all those lessons within a building. That skill of uniting the past, the present, and something that feels futuristic, that is ultimately what the AD100 list should be doing, pushing us to think about the past in a new way. I don't think, you know, the future of design is in is something that we've never seen before. It's an interpretation of the past in the context of the future. I mean, Bjarke Ingels is an extraordinary architect. We take something that's sort of conventional and then just knocks it out of the park. To me, he's a future thinker. We're designing this single family home like a big circle on top of a hill in northern Denmark. The house is tailored to the sort of unique desires of this family. So imagine a single house designed as much for the cars as for the people. A, a single ribbon of rooms 
cars in one end and the living room in the other end, wrapped around the top of the hill, where every room is looking out over the landscape and out over the intimacy of the garden. It has the effect that when he, he goes to bed every night, he looks across his garden and down into uh, all of his parked cars and can say goodnight, just like my, my son said, says goodnight to his, uh, to his teddy bears. At the same time, we're also designing a 3D printed home for four astronauts to live uh, on the moon. The most effective way to do it is with a single pivot, then essentially two redundant houses, one for two astronauts and one for two astronauts. So strangely, rather different, but also rather similar uh, program requirements and, 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 and architectural end results by committing to something fully, you force yourself onto new territory where you may discover and explore new possibilities. And is that part of taste? Yes. He takes that idea of taste and he smashes it. He pushes way beyond it. The less that people stay harnessed to old think, there's a much more openness and opportunity to think about the individual inhabiting the space. What is their experience of the space? We are in a position where we need to design new ways of living. If we can understand that people have different traditions of using space and designing for them, um, then we can support the idea that, you know, people can be, that they can be in space, they can be in public space. The interior design of our bodies is so limited and we have to, we keep on the suit the entire time. Much of my entire life has been trying to, you know, kind of make sure that my body feels really comfortable wherever it's at. I was trained in a very, very European model, Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe. Those were the names. Break those buildings apart and you will understand architecture in the 20th and 21st century but I couldn't break apart with exactly what I was seeing based on the tools that I had been supplied with. Leyden is such an interesting talent, classically trained, but he doesn't have a formula, and your eye is surprised and delighted when you look at the work because it's fresh, it's new. He's not relying on like, this is good taste and I always do it, you know? Taste, in my definition, is a construct. Started somewhere in about the 16th or the 17th century um, in Europe. It is not inherent. Taste is something that what has to be schooled on. So it is already confined to a very specific group of people and a very sm specific place. We talk about people either having it or not having it. You know, the West African birthing chair. Does that have taste? I find it strange to speak about things like that in the construct of the word taste. The way in which I approach design today is staying completely open. The Brooklyn Tower occupies the site of the old Brooklyn Dime Savings Bank, also the first place that my parents opened up a passbook account in, as immigrants in this country. The client, she's a Holocaust survivor. She started the renovation when she was 90 years old. When I include my clients' cultural backgrounds, then the possibilities are just endless. Melanie Barnett is an incredible clay and ceramic artist. And the space is being designed not with an idea of 2.5 kids and the dog, a profile of a family that doesn't live there. When I think of Melanie, I think of dancing. And so it's going to be a great space to just shove things into the corner and everyone can party and pull it back together very quickly. So I'm a dance hall reggae queen from the 80s and 90s. Don't play anything past the 90s, you got it? How do we create space that nurtures black life? And what does that look like? 
What's your What's your thoughts? Do you think that we need? We made what is going to turn into the fireplace and the ceramic installation. You have been talking about this wall. Whatever this wall was supposed to be or was it going to be, but it's been a wall that you've been very much interested in creating for a long time. When I was making the work and when I do not just this project, but my work in general, I look at the origins of how the diaspora came about through Atlantic slave trade, through colonialism. Put play, playhouse here. That's it, yeah. When people look at it, they ask, are they broken? Yes, they're cut, but we could put them back together. And the idea is, is that we put these patterns back together because we create new stories, new narratives. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. My parents immigrated from Trinidad and Tobago. My father came here to study art. My mother got the kind of work that she could get. She was a domestic. And my father really took me under his wing, whereas other kids had a football field. My Saturday afternoons were dedicated to walking up Eastern Parkway, heading to the Brooklyn Museum, and taking classes with college-age students. And so here I was, this 13-year-old kid, just remember the first time I saw someone drop the robe. <laughs> there was not a moment in my life when art wasn't considered as a part of my responsibility to my family. My drawing happens everywhere, on the back of an envelope, on the walls. I draw a lot on drawings. There's still something very peaceful about drawing to me that connects me again to something a lot more basic. People believe that they need so much stuff. But for me, telling my own truth in my own space is critical. And I want to let my clients know that in your personal space, you're allowed to do whatever you want to do. When I walk through that turquoise door, I'm gonna say, I'm at home and I feel me. The house is full with a lot of joyful moments of not being as uptight as architecture can be. If one is made to feel comfortable in their bodies within the space, I'm all for it. It's capturing somebody's personality, capturing that dream and making it into decorative reality. Gorgeous. Love it. Beautiful. Turn the wrist out a little bit. Beautiful. Did she have some diamonds on or something? Yeah, in her ears, yeah. Okay, great. Beautiful. Okay, great. Do you want to see? One of the things I love about the magic of shooting a cover, particularly with a celebrity, is that you can get a little spicy. We definitely tempted Ellen with it. We said, hey, how are we going to get a little bit of that sexiness for your shoot? And so we thought, pull out her vintage car, get you in an oiled up wetsuit, throw on some diamond earrings, give you a surfboard, and let's see what happens. You are able to make magic. Not the same magic, it's different magic for everyone. That's what makes me tick. That's what makes me happy. Hey, that's the dream. The power of turning fiction into fact is the ultimate superpower of the, of the designer. It's this opportunity to really imagine and create the most uh, w wondrous uh, worlds. The truth is, if we stick with established good taste, architecture, interior design, and landscape design would not be evolving. You've seen the idea of taste in fashion and in movies and pop culture and music. It's always changing. And I do think that's important in our practice too, that we move forward into new ideas. to taste, I think what makes you happy is all that matters. In a lot of ways, it's a feeling. It's just a feeling of appreciation and beauty and, and uniqueness. If you have humility as a decorator, which not everyone does, you want the room to belong to the person. And so you want to take this opportunity to make a portrait. Each time I meet a client and walk into a house, 
I need to understand their personality and how I want to reflect that into the home. I think that to make something useful is actually quite beautiful. Being Korean American, my parents always said, you know, if you're not a doctor or lawyer, you'll never be accepted. And when I told my parents that I wanted to go into interior design, they were pretty horrified. Taste is about authenticity of, of, your, of yourself in the world. If you can create a space that holds somebody there, where they don't want to leave, where that's it and it's enough, that for me is knowing you've done a good job.